you can have the best product out there, but if you can't pitch it to an investor and get them excited, you're done. When it comes to startups, it doesn't matter if you have a product that's going to change the world. It's all for nothing if you can't make your investors excited about you and your product. You only get one chance with your investors to make that happen. In this episode of Establishing Your Empire, we have a fascinating conversation with Brett Sharanow, the CEO and founder of Broadscope Consulting. If you've ever wanted to learn about how to raise capital or learn about mistakes people make and how to avoid them, this is the episode for you. Brett has helped companies raise more than $800 million and has facilitated exits valued at more than $6 billion. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography, but business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right, I got Brett here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today with your beautiful office set up in the background. <laughs> I'm real excited to talk about, you know, if you've ever thought about creating a startup, selling your startup, raising funding for your startup, I think this is the episode to listen to. I think we're going to have a ton of value. Thank, thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, Dan. I'm really, really happy to be here, and thanks for having me on. So let's start with probably my worst question is what's what's the elevator pitch? You know, like if you say, who is Brett? What do you do? Like, what do you usually say? Ah, great question. Um, and, and I have a great answer for it too. Um, I, I focus on two areas, raising capital and strategy work for startup and high growth companies. Uh, and my my compelling case for customers, as I like to say, because I ask that of all my clients, we have to have a compelling case for customers in order both to raise money and to scale the business. So mine is uh, dramatically increase the chances of the client to raise capital, mostly from venture capitalists and angel investors, and significantly reduce the time to the raise. Now, there's many pieces behind that, landmines that we have to avoid and all that. But those are the two big pieces up front. So I, and I know I want to dig into that a ton, but let's go back. Like, how did you actually get into this, you know, VC capital area? Like, where did you start? Where, how, how did that path get you there? Because I've read that you're also, um, and forgive me if I'm wrong, like an engineer and you're kind of in a whole different area of kind of interest as well. So yeah, I do. My path was a very circuitous one. I didn't do the Wharton MBA, get hired and do consulting. Uh, I started out and I need to go back to my formative years. I, I had a mechanic mentor who was one of the old time master mechanics when I was about 11. This guy could put his hands on an engine and tell you what was wrong with it. And wow. when I first met him, I realized that I wanted to be able to do that. I didn't know much at 11, but by the time I was 14, he had taught me to rebuild engines. So I had nine years with him that taught me how to approach problems. And it doesn't matter whether it's a car or a tractor or a motorcycle or a truck or a television. The way that I now look at a business is the same way I looked at my mechanics work. What's going on with the system? What's going on with the pieces? And how can we make the whole system better? So I started there, uh, bachelor's in chemistry, became a chemist and did that for a while, developing adhesive systems for the electronics industry in Silicon Valley. Moved up to a director of marketing and sales position at a startup in the Bay Area. Uh, that startup was bought by a Fortune 50 company. Uh, and at that point, I left and started consulting on my own. Uh, and then incredibly fortunately, I got my second mentor, this time in the area of finance and strategy. And this was uh, my first professor from my MBA, uh, who's one of the top people in the country in valuation and strategy work. 
and just fortunately connected with him. Uh, after my MBA, we stayed in touch. And then he had a project that he brought me in for after he had left his consulting firm. And that two-week project turned into 10 years. So that, that 10 years gave me the base from which I'm able to do what I do now. He retired and I've continued on for the last 20 plus. That has allowed me to do this kind of work today. Let's go back to those, you know, rebuilding engines and all that way back in the day. Was there a certain car, truck, plane, anything that you like just really got you excited back then or even now? Um, yeah, probably my first car. Uh, this mechanic, his name was Joe. Um, he actually sold me, I think it was $100, uh, a 1965 Corvair Corsa. And Very any cool. of you who remember that era, Ralph Nader essentially cratered the, the Corvair because it had a rear engine like the Volkswagen. And when it was involved in a head-on crash, the front end didn't do very well. And a lot of people were injured in, and killed in Corvair accidents. But I had one of the first. It was cherry red. Uh, and mine was the Corsa model, which had four single barrel carburetors on it. I got the car when I was before I was even driving at 16, rebuilt it. So by the time I was driving and had my permit, that was my car. Uh, and in New York, where I grew up, that car could go through almost anything because the weight was over the back wheels. So in the middle of snow season, that car was driving up hills and most everybody else was on the side, you know, kind of stuck. Uh, but that I loved that car. It was great. And, you know, I've been through many since then. If you ask me the question today, because you did mention airplane, so I have to bring up a thing called the gyroplane. I'm a gyroplane pilot and a gyroplane is a cross between a helicopter and an airplane. Uh, it's got a rotor. Uh, but they're amazing aircraft, extremely popular in Europe, and they're just starting to become popular in the United States. Uh, and a company in Italy called Magni Gyro makes the best gyroplanes in the world. Uh, and that's that's my current favorite vehicle out there today. Well, I was going to go with the the old car. So I have a I do have a 1969 Camaro convertible. So if I have okay. any problems... I'm going to call you up with a, <laughs> not if, when, when I have problems. Yeah. And then I, 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 I did read about you, you into those, uh, gyroplanes and, and those just seem interesting because, and, and, and maybe walk me through it a little bit more. Cause I just think it's super interesting. The way the engine actually works is completely different than a normal plane, right? It uses a lot less pro propulsion. Am I wrong there? Um, they, they work, uh, be, they're like a cross between a helicopter and an airplane. They were actually developed before helicopters by a gentleman in Spain, Juan Sierva. Um, and the way they work is there's an engine in the back that actually pushes the aircraft through the air. And there is a blade up top that looks like a helicopter blade, but it doesn't have an engine on it. It free spins. It's called auto rotation. And what happens is think about a, a wind turbine uh, or if you want to go back a few years, uh, a pinwheel. And when you blow on a wind turbine or a pinwheel, uh, the blades spin. And that's the way a gyroplane works. You get to the end of the runway and you start the blade spinning either with a, a push in the old days, literally somebody spun the blade or with a, a pre-rotator, the engine starts it driving. And then once it starts driving, the, the drive shaft disconnects and you start moving down the runway. And the blades are angled to the wind like this so that as they move through the air, the faster they move through the air, just like a wind turbine, the faster they spin. And as you're going down the runway being pushed, the blades provide the lift. They're actually a circular wing. And at some point, when you get up to about 25, 30 miles an hour down the runway, there's enough lift and the gyroplane lifts off. The, the amazing thing about gyroplanes is if the engine in the back quits, the rotor doesn't know it. So you just start floating down like a butterfly and you find a place to land and you can land them in the size of a tennis court in an emergency. So they're incredibly safe from that perspective. They're also great because the wing is so narrow, not like a big wing on an airplane that when you get a gust of wind, you're being bounced all over the sky. The, the wing is so narrow that they're very, the, the effect of the wind on them is very low. So you can fly them in conditions that you would never be able to fly a regular airplane. So let's take this to parallel to your actual what you do for you know for your business side do you, is this something that is just fun or do you actually you know invest in this area or are a part of companies or anything like that or is this just basically a hobby uh it's actually both um right. i started flying gyros about six years ago 
a uh, friend of mine introduced me to them and I, I fell in love with the actual aircraft and how they work. Uh, and during a visit to Italy uh, five years ago, I went to the factory uh, with, with the principal reason to just learn more about them, to meet the family, the Magni family that makes them, and also to potentially open up a dealership in Northern California. Uh, and the conversation morphed into what do you do? And I am now the U.S. representative for Magni Gyro uh, for all of their strategy, sales and marketing, dealer support, trade shows, all of that. So I'm also responsible for FAA type certification. So I've taken it on as a passion project, as my wife and I like to call it. And I love to fly them. So it's part part hobby, also part work. And uh, it's the first time I've been able to meld those. And it's it's actually amazing to be able to do that. I always have tried to. It's Sometimes it doesn't make sense. And sometimes you get in deeper than you should because you have some emotions tied to it or something. But if possible, it's one of the f- most fun things. Uh, you, you had a couple other things in there that I want to ask about mentorship. And, you know, there's a lot of different places to take it. But you, you kind of met, met two different uh, people who were very instructive to where you're at today. Any advice for somebody who, you know, maybe wants to get in an area, how to meet a mentor, how to be a mentee, any, any, any place you want to take it. But I think it's a, a powerful um, a place to talk about. Yeah, um, I'm, I am incredibly fortunate to both of those people because there's no way I would be where I am without my mechanic, Joe, and my finance strategy person, Lynn Morris. Um, n- not a chance. I think the way I found them and the way I would recommend for somebody who wants to find them, by the way, I think it is the best way to learn so much about the the business, the career, whatever it is you're doing. You know, I, I was looking at becoming an auto mechanic after my time with Joe, uh, but fundamentally to be open. And what I mean by that is I was friends with Joe's son and we used to hang out and play football together. And one day I met the dad, Joe, and was just open to what's happening here. And Joe was willing to take me under his wing. So if I didn't have that openness to new experiences uh, and new things in my life, that never would have happened. Exact same thing uh, for when I worked for Lynn or worked with him, first professor of MBA. I knew after the second class with him that I wanted to work with him. He was the first person that I had ever seen and heard put together all aspects of a business and understand it. So accounting, finance, economics, marketing, sales, human resources. The class I took with him was called strategic financial planning. And he was able to put all of those pieces together in this course in a way that I had never seen done. So by the time I got out of that that class, I had a a strategic way to look at businesses rather than a tactical way to look at the details of the business. And at that point, it was very clear I wanted to do work with him in the future. I let him know that. He and I stayed in touch. I took every opportunity I could to work with him, to learn from him. And then the opportunity presented it. And of course, I jumped at it. Even though it was only a two-week project, even two weeks with him would have been great. And of course, as I said earlier, it turned into 10 years. So it just it's just one of those things. And I think it's a great question in terms of becoming a mentee. Again, from my perspective, it was the best thing I've done in my entire career, being open to taking direction and learning like a sponge from people who really knew what they were doing. I think it's a very valuable uh, way of looking at it, being open. But also, you basically were also saying that you attach yourself more to the people than the ideas a little bit because you went, you know, all the way from auto mechanic over here to completely high level business situations. But I think there's not a, probably a bigger hack out there than attach yourself to people. And you'd be surprised of how much, especially a little bit older people want to teach you what they know. Um, and all levels. I mean, I love it even at my level, but like, I think everybody, not everyone, but there's a large amount of people out there that will, will love to kind of download everything that they've learned over those years. So you can kind of expedite, your career or what you want to do and, uh, and actually might avoid some mistakes that they made along the way. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're right. It is the person the, the ideas were, what were part of what attracted me and the person was definitely what attracted me. I mean, Joe provided something that I had no place else in my life at age 11. 
And it was certainly the mechanics part, but it was also that the training, the, the acceptance, the willingness to be open to me as an 11 year old and teach me what he knew. And, and that's something that I, I could never replace. Let's talk about startups for a bit because startups are very hot right now. But then we also have this economy kind of jumping around, being interesting, the market's down. We have a, a war overseas. I guess the first place to start would be, are, we, are you seeing any um, changes in the amount of funding, the amount of deals, anything like that? Is, is, has anything gone, you know, has it gone down? It seems like it probably should have, but I don't know. Have you seen anything unique there? So I uh, have a few things to say about it. I've got three uh, capital raises going right now with three separate companies, uh, a seed round raise of $3 million, a Series A for $10 million in the medical space, and a $100 million raise uh, in the autonomous vehicle space. Uh, think about vehicles that are supposed to be or stated to be autonomous right now. And the one that, of course, comes to mind because of the lawsuit and, and the change in governmental regulation that came out yesterday is Tesla. Uh, Tesla's got the ADA system, the, the assisted driving system that's supposed to allow you to al allow the car to pilot itself. And they've had a lot of crashes. Um, and they've had a lot of crashes into emergency vehicles because emergency vehicles are typically parked in the middle of the road with their lights when they have to deal with something. And the ADA system in the Teslas isn't seeing the vehicle. This company has software that verifies and validates all of the hardware, all of the software, all of the sensors and everything, and tests what are called edge conditions. These are conditions outside the normal re realm of driving that happen, like when there's an emergency vehicle and it's raining and a child runs in front of the car, you know, the conditions that we don't see very often, their software tests it and verifies and validates that everything works. So with that said, uh, there has been significant change over the last few months with, what hap with what's happened in the economy and world wars, that kind of thing. First up, you know, you asked, is there, is there less money? There's plenty of money. The venture capitalists have plenty of dry powder they're sitting on, as it's called, uh, that, that's sitting there. Uh, so it's not like their money has gone down. There's still big piles of money. Uh, and venture capitalists still have to meet the needs of their, of their limited partners who put the money in, in terms of rates of return and time of return. So, so they're in a little bit of a quandary because they have to put the money to use and the economy is down. So what do they do? Yes, there's a lot of up and down right now. And really what it provides to investors is uncertainty. That's number one. Number two, private companies, venture capitalists see that the public markets are down in terms of value. Public markets going down forces private market values down as well. So multiples that applied even six months ago to uh, annual recurring revenue on a business now are, have plummeted. And that affects the valuation, how much a company has to give up in order to get money today. So that's here, yes. And I'm seeing that, matter of fact, I had a conversation with one of my CEOs yesterday about that. What are we going to do now on this raise? Are we going to raise the same amount of money? Are we going to try to raise less money to give up less of the company? How does this work? So that's an ongoing piece. Third, investors are still looking for great companies. As I said a few minutes ago, they still have to put the money to work. They still have to give their limited partners returns. So they're being more selective. Values have come down, so they're willing to give less money for the same interest ownership as they were willing to give six or eight months ago. And that's something that the founder needs to be able to take into account. Because if you thought you were going to get, let's just put a number out for argument's sake, $100 million in, in pre-money value, that's the, the value of the company before money is put in. Now, the pre-money value of that same company might only be $30 million. And if you were trying to raise $20 million, now you have to give up way more of the company at a $40 million pre-money value than at a $100 million pre-money value. And if you haven't taken that into consideration when you go out for funding, um, that complicates things dramatically, both for you as the founder, one who's seeking money, and the venture capitalists look at you as if you really don't know what you're doing, right? Because you're asking them for valuations that were 
in place six or eight months ago, not today. So it creates conflict up front. And, and that's what I do my best to help my clients avoid. So now that we know the lay of the land, at least most of it, what do we do about it, right? So let's right. take that that valuation because, and maybe dive into it. And, and I'm sure you talk about hours of all this stuff, like the pre-valuation of a startup. That's kind of crazy because how do you even get that? You know, how do you even know? And then um, I think that more importantly is now that we know where the state of the of the business right now, what do we do about it, right? How do how do we trudge forward? Yeah. So yeah, we could spend another day just talking okay. about those two questions, literally. Um, but sure. let me see if I can give you a quick one. Valuation per se up front is part art and part science. The science part is looking at the current markets and looking at how much value an investor is willing to attribute to a company that either doesn't have revenues, a real startup, right? Who's, who's got money that they're spending to get their product developed or who has very low revenues. So you can't, you can't use any kind of normal methodology to value the company that would be done in school, for example. There's a thing called discounted cash flow where you, for a company that's up and running, a going concern, you can look at their cash flows over time out into infinity and then discount those cash flows back to today at a discount rate that works and come up with a value. And you can do that with a public company. Uh, you can go out and get what are called value line data. Value line is a company that provides forecast information for big companies. And you can use the value line data and look at cash flows and discount it back and figure out what you think the value is compared to what value line and the markets think the value is. But you can't do that with a startup. Uh, and you can't do that with a high growth company. So this is where the art comes in. This is where um, sophisticated investors, venture capitalists and private equity, not so much angel investors, they don't typically have the sophistication that a VC or a, or a private equity firm does. Uh, and they have to look at what are they going to use to value the business? The multiple that I was talking about a few moments ago, and that multiple is usually multiplied times revenues. I used average recurring revenues as one example. Uh, sometimes it's just plain gap revenues, generally accepted accounting procedure revenues. And sometimes it's EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. But they have to come up with a number that says, these companies over here that just got funding or sold, were acquired, their value is six times revenues. So we're going to apply that same multiple or a similar multiple towards your company, but your company isn't at the place that company was, so it's more risky. So we're going to decrease that multiple. So valuation is a, is a very, very big topic in startups. How much money can you get for the company? Uh, and CEO who I'm working with right now said something quite brilliant yesterday. He said, we allow the venture capitalists to set the valuation. And that's the only choice you have. Y you can pause it. You can put out a number to them. But fundamentally, the reason you're, you're going to a venture capitalist for money is they're the ones that set the price. They have the expertise. And that's why the more v venture capitalists you talk with, the more expertise they have, the closer you will get to honing in on a value that the community at large believes is right for your firm. Now, your second question is, what do we do about this? Mm -hmm. So I'm dealing with that now with all three of my companies. Um, let's start off with the smallest one first. They're raising a $3 million seed round. Uh, there's a lot of money being put into seed round companies right now because the amounts so much smaller. So the risk for the firm is much smaller. If I'm putting $3 million in 10 times for $30 million total, I have 10 companies that I can look at the risk on and that risk averages out over the 10 versus if I'm putting $30 million into one company, if that company does well, I can hit a home run. But if that company does poorly, I can lose the entire 30 million. So when you look at that, this is the, the rule of investing in the markets. The best way to make the most money in the stock market is invest in one company. The best way to lose most of your money in the markets is invest in one company. So the VCs are trying to avoid that. And that's why they're trying to spread their money out more. So for small company startups, 
easier to get money today because even the larger firms are looking at funneling some more money into seed. Now, the valuations still come down, so we still need to address that. But the money's there if they, if they need it and want it. And I, I think I need to have a quick aside here, need it and want it, and have what I call as a compelling case for customers. Any business that's raising money needs to have a product or a service that their customer literally wants to rip out of their hands and pay them for it. It's so good. So think back to the first Apple iPhones that came out and the lines were around the block waiting for the phone. That's a compelling case for customers. And most companies who are trying to raise money don't have that. They think they do. Um, I like using my AirPod case. They think they know that my compelling case for customers is it's plastic and it's got a hinge on it and you can charge the AirPods in here. That's really cool not a compelling case for customers. Why do I want this? Sound quality is there. It allows me to not be tethered to my device. And until you understand your compelling case for customers and can articulate it well, raising money is a challenge. So that has to be a piece of this. And do you now, let's think move that up. It's, it's, it's best to have that piece and test it out and having actual customer data before f- raising in general? Is, or, do, or do you suggest raising before then? You know, I know I'm jumping around here, but this is very important stuff. You know, a lot of people are trying to figure out how do I value my startup? When do I go get money? You know, all these things, right? Um, so do you typically go get the money to build your product and hope that you get the compelling customers, you know, wanting it? Or do you figure it out, bootstrap it and whatever and, and get the customer data? So rule of thumb is... Um, I like my clients to have their compelling case for customers as early in the process as they can. Uh, And and the compelling case for customers actually drives the business strategy. So if a client comes to me and they're really excited about their product or service, which if they're not, we should do something else because they're not going to go anywhere. Right. But they're excited. They're presenting their pitch to me. Um, You can see in their body that they're present and that, they believe they have something that's amazing. At that point, they need to be able to articulate their compelling case for customers. And if they can't, my recommendation is before you try to raise anything, go back and articulate it. Because as excited as you are about your product, the customer needs to be excited about it. Me being excited about this widget doesn't sell this widget. The customer seeing this and saying, wow, I need to have this because it solves a problem, makes my life easier, whatever. That's what drives the sale. So that's one of the first things I will deal with when working with a client. I I have a question sheet that gets sent out to anybody before I even have my first Zoom with them. And the first question, maybe it's the second question. The first question is describe your product in a sentence or two. The second question is what's your compelling case for customers? And then I detail what that means. Because I want to see, do they have that up front? And if not, that's something that I need to address on the first call, at least to have them understand that we need that before they can raise money and probably because their business is going to be successful. That's really critical to the process. Now, the second or third or fourth piece of your question, at what point do you then do various things? When do you go out for money? How much money do you raise? Uh, can you raise money when you only have a compelling case for customers and an idea, not even a 3D model of your, of your product? Um, and the answer is that's complex. Every business is different. I have to work with my client every time somebody comes to me with their individual circumstances. What's happening for them? What's happening in the marketplace? Does the marketplace need that vehicle? What what is the best way to move this forward? For some companies, my recommendation is go out and raise half a million, a million dollars in friends and family money. These are people that know and trust you. and And you are what's driving the raise. Their trust in you is driving them to give you money. They may or may not understand the widget, but you have to sell yourself to them and If you're excited enough and can convince them, they'll give you money. 
that friends and family money is important because that allows you to take the next step, which is start going out and doing the things you mentioned. Can I get customers? Can I do focus groups where I can ask people, would you buy this? How much would you pay for it? Let them play with it. Are they excited about it? Um, do I need to do some research and development to go from a 3D uh, model to something that works? Like this might just be a model, but could I get it to work where I can actually put the recharging unit in here and put the AirPods in and make them recharge? That Those stages are very important. And when I'm working with a client, part of our work is to do what's called financial modeling, to be able to put the strategy of a business that a client would talk to me about, those words, into numbers that we can then look at and say, okay, you need this many people, you need this much to spend on building the product, research and development, marketing and sales. And what comes out of the model is what is the cash needs of the company? What are the cash needs of the company? At what point in time? And the model lets us figure out how much we need in the first round, when we need the second round and how much we need, what kind of valuation we can attribute to the company, and perhaps most importantly, does everything I just talked about fit into a model that investors are used to, to put money into? Um, for example, I had a, a client two weeks ago that came to me uh, that had a valuation that they believed was correct for their company because they had a valuation firm value the, f value the firm. The valuation was not in the ballpark of anything I would consider reasonable if I was the investor for two reasons. One, the valuation that they had done was six months ago. So the market changes that we talked about a few moments ago have taken place since then. And valuations have come down by more than half in that time, in some cases, 70%. So that's number one. Secondly, um, the companies that they were looking at that they used as comparables to compare the company that came to me with what has happened in the marketplace were overvalued because there was a lot of what's called froth, a lot of excitement in the marketplace one and two years ago. And these companies raised a lot of money at really high valuations. That doesn't apply today. So they came to me and they believed, I think their valuation was $140 million. And I said, I don't believe any investor is going to give you money based on $140 million valuation today. And, and I gave them some ground. Kind of, it's kind of a problem with appraisers in general, not even in this area. You pay them and they want you to be happy. <laughs> so they <laughs> give you a really nice value. Anyway, continue. Yes. So as it turned out, um, they truly believe the valuation number. And uh, they, they drove that home with me. This is what we want. And I, I said, totally get that and understand. And we're not a good fit to work together because I only have two rules to work with somebody. They have to have raised some money so that I see they have the capability to raise money. Even from friends and family is fine. It tells me they, they, they've got some capability and that whatever their widget is, somebody got excited about it. That's great. And number two, the founder CEO has to listen. They don't have to do what I say, but they have to listen. And this team struck me as a team that wasn't willing to do that. So we, I passed and I wish them the best of luck. And I really hope they can get money to, to do the product because I, I think the product's amazing. Uh, and I think they're, they're, they've got a compelling case for customer and they've got a niche in the market that's wonderful, but they have to come back to reality. And a lot of the times what brings companies back to reality is going out to raise money and the venture capitalists saying, how much do you think this company's worth? And the person puts out that the CEO says 140 million. And it's almost like, you know, in the old days where the cane used to come and pull somebody off stage, uh, it's that kind of thing. Um, and the problem with that, of course, Darren, is that you only get one chance with every investor. So if you made your pitch and you came in at 140 million, it's hard to come back uh, and say, you know what, we're willing to take 40 million for pre-money value. Um, and if the investor is super interested and, and they think you're genuine, they might do that. But much better to go in realistic and say, you know what? I know I need, I'm just going to pick a number, 20 million to make this company get to cash flow break even where I don't need any more money, but I can't raise 20 million right now. This gets back to your question of how do you deal with the valuation issues? 
Part of it is saying, what will the market bear? What can I do to be successful? And my answer is, I can't raise 20 million now at the valuation I need. So what do I do? Well, in most cases, the clients I'm working with right now, we're backing off the amount of the raise so that we're taking less money. We're putting less money into the financial model that we are raising, and we are moving a next raise to a good 18 to 24 months out to where we'll be able to reach some milestones that will show that this company does have legs. It can be successful. That's number one. So we'll be able to get a higher valuation to raise the remaining 20 million or whatever else we need to raise at that point in time. Uh, and hope that the external markets change enough in that 18 to 24 month time frame that things start coming back. So that's really the fundamental case. Now, your next question will probably be what happens if you can't, if you need 20 million and you and 5 million won't do it? Right. Well, then, then that's where working with the client comes into play. If the markets won't give you the money, and that's the money you need, we have to find solution B, C, or D. Uh, and that's where, you know, doing this for so long, I, I want to help them come up with solution B, C, or D so that they can raise $5 million, that it is sufficient for the period of time, or we figure out some other way around this. Do, do we pivot? Do we look at going into some other area? Do we look at bringing in revenues earlier? There's many ways we can look at, do we cut expenses? Uh, you know, how do we do this so we can still be successful and scale the business without shooting ourselves in the foot because we have cut R and D and that's critical to the business. What about just how to avoid some mistakes that founders typically make in the, in the startup world, the non-financial ones, maybe, because we covered a lot in there, anything that you've seen over these years or anything that you could, you know, uh, any advice you could, you could give? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. Um, and, and you know enough to ask that question, which is great. I call it the minefield that founders are going to step on. And when you do a startup, you are walking into a minefield. There's no way to avoid it. It's part of, of what it takes to do a startup. Uh, and if you're really trying to grow and scale the business to become large, you know, hundred million dollar revenues kind of thing in five to seven years and a potential billion dollar valuation, the, the unicorns that you hear about. You can't step on many or any mines and be successful. So what does that look like? Well, everything it looks like except the financials. And of course, the financials have their own minds, which I won't spend a lot of time getting into, but even such things as how much money you raise is a minefield. Because if you raise too little and now you weren't able to reach the milestones that you put out to the investors in 12 or 18 or 24 months, now you're in a situation where it's much harder to raise money because you haven't done what you said you're going to do. And you may be in a situation where you have to take what's called a down round. The valuation goes down from the previous round, which means you have to give up a lot more equity ownership in the company. And founders don't want to do that. A lot of companies, they run into down rounds because either external changes in the market or they haven't done what they said they were going to do. So huge minefield there that we could literally spend hours on. But let's put that to the side. Let's talk about other non-financial things. And it literally starts when you think about starting a company. One of the things I recommend to clients at the beginning, and I will ask the question, who is your legal counsel? Who has formed the business for you? Have you formed a partnership? Have you formed an S corporation, a C corporation, an LLC? And has your counsel done this dozens and dozens of times? Many founders go out and they will go to their local general attorney because they're doing a startup. This person says they can, you know, form a C corp and they can, but they also don't have the expertise to know what's going to happen over the coming five years if this startup's going to be that unicorn, hugely successful. And if your company formation documents aren't set up well, if you form the wrong kind of entity, if your initial capitalization is improper or doesn't meet the needs of venture capital type investors, if that's the kind of money you're seeking, any one of those things complicate the deal. Uh, I like to talk about being on the railroad tracks. 
and investors like startup founders to be on the tracks. And what that means is the founders are doing, first of all, they know what to do and they are doing the things that investors expect them to do. So they've formed the right type of company. The a number of shares are done correctly. They haven't taken a lot of debt up front before they try to go out and raise equity. So they haven't gone out and gotten a bank loan or something like that, which hugely complicates the raise process for a variety of reasons. They're looking for companies that are on the tracks because it makes the raise easier for them because it fits in to their model. Not that they set it up, but they've learned over the last decades what works and what doesn't. You know, people ask me all the time, I need to raise a series A round and I want to give up 10% of the company. And I sit at this end of the Zoom call or at the other side of the table and smile and say, great, I understand you want to raise that money. You're not going to be able to raise it giving up 10% of the company in most cases. If you've invented a time machine, you will be able to give up 10% of the company for that money. But, but other than something like that, which is this amazing product that can change the world, venture capitalists are not going to typically do that. And, and the reason is not because they can't calculate what happens if they do that. It's because they know over time what works for their model of putting money into companies on average is taking someplace between 20 and 35% of a company at the Series A round. They know that if they take that much percentage and if the company's successful, they'll do well, their limited partners will do well, and they will have a successful company. And they will also make their founders a lot of money and make them hugely successful. So they're making the pie for that founder huge. So dilution, which means how much of the company you're giving up, is much less of an issue. And most founders, unfortunately, that's pretty much their number one focus. How much am I being diluted? How much of the company am I giving up? And it's an important piece. But if that's your focus, you're missing what a startup is there for. You're raising money because there's a massive market, hopefully, and you want to take a good chunk of that market. 10 or 20% is typically thought of as about what you want to get as a startup who's taking a good percentage of the massive market. In order to do that, though, you need to raise money. So the investor is giving you money to make the pie that you have bigger. Dilution becomes less of an issue. So back to your question a few minutes ago about the minefield. This is another one that is a huge mine, focusing only on dilution and not focusing on the other issues that will significantly affect your ability as founder to run the company well. The governance issues at the board level are huge. And if you pay attention only dilution, but now you've given up too many seats on the board so that the board can outvote you as founder, it doesn't matter if you own 62% of the company. They're going to make the decisions. You work at the board's behest as CEO and they're going to either fire you or have you do what they think is right. They're not doing it because they don't like you. They're doing it because they've got decades of experience and they think what they want to do is better. So myriad, hundreds of questions that have to be dealt with as a startup. And it's one of the places when I'm talking with a client, I'm trying to give them a sense of there's a lot of things you don't know that you don't know because Right? Even founders that I've worked with before, a lot of my clients are repeat. Uh, I've got one CEO I've worked with four times, and he did do a unicorn and exited hugely and profitably, and uh, the investors did well. It was, a, it was a home run you know, out of the park on the other side of the stadium. On his fourth startup, the first or second telephone call he made was to me and my partner at the time. Because he'd done three startups, he knew he needed help, and he knew he didn't know what he didn't know, even though he'd done three of them. So, you know, we were the second or third or fourth call he made, and I worked with him until pretty much the acquisition, four and a half years. And it was because, you know, I brought a set of skills that he knew he needed in, in terms of strategy, financial modeling, avoiding the minefields, the pitch deck, coaching him through the pitch deck, all of that, all of that comes into play. You know, you can have the best product out there, but if you can't pitch it 
to an investor and get them excited, you're done. And, and what I'm hearing here is, which is not near as exciting for a founder or a builder is get your foundation set up. Make sure you have a great foundation before doing a lot of things. If you don't know, research or talk to people of how to set up everything properly. Because a lot of times when you're creating a company or an idea or doing something, you just want to move forward with the idea. And then it sounds like that can actually cost you more time, money, effort, uh, valuation, et cetera, et cetera, down the line if you don't actually have the foundation figured out first. Yes, and there's a quandary with that question or doing that. And the quandary is getting the foundation set up well costs money. Even hiring the startup attorney to set up the C-Corp well costs money. Now, the good startup attorneys that, that I work with, they've got what's called corporation in a box. They literally pull it off the shelf. They know all the standards that need to be in place. And it's not that much money to do it well from the beginning. But you need to go to that kind of an attorney to begin with. So, yes, there has to be a good foundation, certainly. And there's always a balance between should I develop the product more so I've got a, a prototype to show or should I spend money on setting myself up well? And that balance as CEO is one of the most difficult things you're going to face from now until you're no longer CEO, period. A client I'm working with right now, they're in the middle of, should we work on developing the product more? Should we work on putting the quality systems in place first because we're seeing some quality issues here? And should we slow this down to make sure that we're locked up or should we do something else? And again, that's one of those minefield questions. And if you answer it wrong, you may not be able to get to the milestones that you put out there in a way that will convince the next round investors to put money in and you may not be able to get funding. So a big piece. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think that's with everything with starting, like, you know, how much do you plan on and doing it perfectly versus just going? Because if you plan too much, you won't even start. What about for you? What's, you know, what's five years from now? You, you know, you're doing a lot of consulting now. Is that going to be something that you feel like you're going to continue to do or you're going to change up? Or like, what, what, what do you see five years from now on your horizon? So my business has morphed over the last 30 years. When I started with Lynn Morris, uh, the gentleman I was working with, a uh, professor at my MBA, uh, he was the strategist and I was doing with the tactical work. I was building financial models, um, building pitch decks, uh, doing the research. I was the hands-on person. Uh, and I remember poignantly many times where I would be building a model or doing something and I thought I, I had everything known and he would come in and ask a question and I, I would be flabbergasted that he asked that question. And, and my thought was, how could he know to ask that question? He's not doing the modeling. And it was because of his 30 years doing the work. Well, I'm at that place now after 32, 33 years of doing this. And I've, I've transitioned my business over the last 10 from doing the model coding, building the pitch deck, doing the research into more of the advisory role, holding the whole raise. So that was a transition that I took on because that transition allows me to work with a lot more clients simultaneously. When I'm building a model for a client, I could typically build one of those, maybe one and a half of those at a time. It's all consuming. But now I can mentor the CFO at the firm, as I'm currently doing on one project, or bring in somebody who's a modeling expert or is wanting to learn to be a modeling expert and have them do the actual coding. So I, I think I will continue to do that. I love doing that kind of work because I can make many more companies successful. I can work with many more founders and entrepreneurs over time, uh, and I can do the high-level strategy work as well as get into the tactics when needed, but, but have the client do the tactical work so that by the time they're ready to raise, they know the business well enough from both a tactical and a strategic perspective that they can answer the questions for the investors that the investors expect them to be able to answer. Um, I could potentially see doing some teaching down the road. It's one of the things I love. I've done some of it, some of it in the past, uh, so that might be fun. Those kind of things, being able to being able to help more people, and thankfully, I can also be more selective at the kinds of projects I do. So, you know, my Magni Gyro project, working with gyroplanes in Italy, is a passion project. Right. I couldn't have done that twenty years ago. I can do that now. 
you know, yeah. I'm working with this autonomous systems company right now and potentially changing the way that um, any kind of autonomous system, including on that unfortunate two incidents of the Boeing 737 MAX crashes, that was an autonomous system that failed. Had they used this type of verification and validation software, that wouldn't have happened. And, you know, so there's autonomous systems all over. It's not just cars and trucks. It's mining vehicles. It's airplanes. It's robots. It's, you know, you really can expand that. And you're going to see a lot of that over the next years. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about this one company, because they have the ability to really change the way autonomous systems are developed verified, validated, and then updated over time. And, you know, it's a great place to be at this at this point in time in this marketplace. Oh, it's super exciting. I mean, I think especially even in like the construction field, I mean, none of those systems, well, not none, but very few of those systems are smart. And uh, it's just going to get so much more precise and, and, and safe for everybody and quicker. Um, but let's go back. Back in those days of you working with, uh, I believe his name was Joe, and the, you know, working in the, uh, on cars and such, you know, maybe your sixteen-year-old self. What advice would you have given your sixteen-year-old self? You know, the the thing that hits me right off the top is um, being in the moment. And let me talk more about that because I don't mean it as an airy fairy uh, kind of thing. One of the big things I took away from my time working with Joe. And by the way, his last name was Adamski, um, amazing man. One of the big things I took away from my time with Joe was uh, doing what I call now, which I didn't know at the time. So this is a piece of advice I would give my 16 year old self was stay in the zone. And what I mean by that is I was able to get to a place in my mechanics work where I was focusing on doing something, even if I had never done it, which happened all the time, because at 16, I hadn't done most everything on a car or a truck or whatever I was working on, whether it was, you know, changing the valves or taking the head off or rebuilding a carburetor, it didn't matter. I might have done something similar, but I'd never done this. I, I got and learned the ability to be in the moment with what I was working on, focus on what I was working on. And what would happen is the rest of the world would go away. Time didn't exist. People would be talking to me and I wouldn't hear them. And I was able to tap into something. I call it the universe now. I don't know what it is or was because I still do it today when I'm working with clients. Tapping into something that I knew what to do next. And, and I say new with quotes around it because, of course, I didn't know, but the guidance I got from wherever it came from allowed me to do the repair at the time. So I, I got this ability and this sense of confidence that I can fix anything, even if I've never touched it before, because no matter what, I will persevere and I will figure it out. Now, fast forward 15 years to working with Lynn Morris at the consulting firm and I had a rough period at the consulting firm, year four or five. We were in the middle of a heavy project and I was struggling and really struggling. All my intellect to bear, not, not cutting it. And Lynn and I had a sit down, which we had every quarter approximately. And, and it's like, Brett, what's going on? What's happening here? You're not doing the work. I see you're struggling. And we made it, we, I made it through that with his coaching and help. And the conversation that we had as a follow-up after that was one of the reasons I wanted to work for you, this was Lynn talking, was I could have gone out and hired the Wharton MBA or the Stanford MBA and worked with them because he had worked with them in the firm that he was a partner in, major consulting firm before. But he said, I knew from my experience what would make this relationship work is if I was working with somebody who could persevere through anything. The people that are brilliant that come out of the Wharton and Stanford, they are brilliant and they can answer questions and do stuff that most everybody else can't do. But a lot of the times he said, when they run into the problems that you ran into four months ago, they can't work through that. They don't have the ability to dive in, deal with whatever needs to be dealt with and come out the other side 
uh, solving the problem and better for it. And I saw you being able to do that. So as hard as this was four months ago for you, how do you feel now? Would you have gone into consulting had you known what you know now four months ago? And I said, I'm not so sure. But being where I am now, absolutely. So I have a kind of a, something I've been uh, dealing with internally question wise. So I have an eight month old baby now and I grew up very poor. So I started my first jobs at 13 and, you know, I always had jobs and this and that's always. So I have that very much the same thing of figure it out, keep trying. I, it had to happen. I didn't have another option. My question, which is I don't have and I don't have this answer is, okay, how would you instill that in somebody else? Or what advice would you get to somebody who's maybe young to, you know, how, how would you develop that in somebody else? And I've actually been thinking about this a lot and I don't have the answer. So if you don't, it's totally okay. But I think it's very powerful because there's so many other people that I work with or have worked with or have tried to hire or, or have interviewed and they just don't have it at, at all. Like the whole, if it's out of their narrow scope, see you later, you know? I'm not, I'm not sure I have a great answer for you either, Darren. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can look back to my history and seeing how my dad worked. You know, he was always head down working when he was at work. He was a pharmacist and an attorney, uh, and he worked in Manhattan uh, at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, and he used to come home at night, and I could tell that focus was his key. And that he would do whatever it took to get the thing done. Now, from my perspective, growing up as a young, a young person, young boy, great to see that, but also being on the receiving side of, oh, but he's not here for me sometimes when I need it. So that's that balance. Whereas Joe at the garage, he was there as much as I needed because I was there. We were working on cars. So he provided that structure, that that ability to accept and mold me without knowing it. I'm not sure he did this consciously, but but to, to be able to provide his care, his guidance, his love in a way that I was able to accept was huge. I already had ingrained the chap put your head down. I too, I was delivering newspapers at 12 and delivering milk at age 10 for the local milk route. Um, so I had that too, but I'm not sure if I was mentoring somebody, how I could get them over the hump of what it takes to put your head down and do it other than relaying my experience that that's what it took for me to get to where I am now, um, which really means, Darren, not giving up. It really means no matter how much you get told no, as a salesperson, for example, this happens all the time. And I did that job, but later on, but how much you get told no, how much people shun you for whatever reason, um, doesn't matter if you've done a bad job and, and made a mistake. We're human. I make mistakes all the time. Can I acknowledge that mistake to myself and then to my client? Hey, you're right here. I did that poorly. Let's move on. Let, you know, to be able to do that and pick myself up, or if I'm mentoring, pick yourself up off the ground and brush it off and move on. And I'm not saying compartmentalize and push it aside like it didn't exist because you're always in your head. I'm saying be able to feel what happened so that you can understand and embody, I just made a mistake. I'm not, I don't have a big amount of shame or anything like that from it. We're human, I made a mistake. What can I learn from it? And then how do I take the next step forward so that I can become a better human being and help society, help myself, help spouse, whatever, to move things along in a way that works for everybody. And certainly that, that works for me and not give up. And this is my last question. Uh, and I end every podcast with this question. It's, <laughs> okay. How would you like to be remembered? Love the question. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work in this area to look at what does it take on the deathbed to say, this is what, this is what, and this is how I want people to remember me. Um, and, you know, I can feel it in my body in terms of he was there to help people. Um, he was there to unselfishly provide um, what people needed, no matter what they were doing. Was it 
um, working on a business, fixing something? Was it he was there to support me when I needed it? He was there to listen and provide guidance. He was probably one of the best listeners I've ever had in my life because he accepted whatever, whatever it was I said and allowed me to move past whatever I was dealing with and become a better human being. I think being there is more powerful than we uh, even think it is at some time. So it's a powerful message, message, and I really appreciate you being on the show. We covered a whole different, you know, fifteen different areas, and it was it was really it was a big pleasure to have you on the uh, podcast. Darren, it's been a pleasure. I I thoroughly appreciate your questions. I think I'll end with, do you know who Terry Gross Gross is from NPR? But she Six, is one right. of the she's one of the best interviewers that I've ever heard. She participates with her interviewee in a way that is so present and real that the interviewee feels comfortable and she gets interviews out of people that when I listen, I'm in awe. And um, your interview style is very similar to hers. So I just wanted to acknowledge and appreciate that um, in, in where we've gone in the last hour or so. Um, and that's, that's very kind. And I'll, I'll have to definitely take a deep dive into her, to her body of work yeah. because, you know, this is, I think one of the big things that a podcast has given me is, you know, you were talking about earlier, like, you know, founder needs to listen. And that has been probably the biggest benefit that I've gotten is to stop talking <laughs> and listen <laughs> and truly listen though, uh, understand what somebody's saying because, you know, you're able to talk to a, a wide variety of people that have done really neat stuff. Like your body of work is amazing. And the most, I, the most I can get from it is not adding my two cents, but listening to what you have to say, you know, mm. but mm -hmm. well, thank you very much for having me on. It's really been a wonderful hour spent on a, on a Friday for sure. Cheers. Cheers.